Welcome again to Perspectives with Asima Silva. As you've noticed in our last few episodes, we've been talking about the hot topic that everyone has been talking about since October 7th, um, the Israel-Palestinian issue. And I have chosen to cover a lot of the Palestinian side, uh, partly because, as we've noticed, um, our mainstream media, especially Western media, does not cover the Palestinian side. And um, I have personally noticed that, and my friends have noticed, that a lot of our posts on social media um, have been censored. So this is our only way to really talk about this issue, to hear the other side, hence the whole point of this program, getting other people's perspectives and other sides' perspectives. Our first show, when I had done this, we went over the history of Palestine. Uh, we had Dr. Najjar talk about he's a Palestinian and talked about how this whole conflict actually arose. Uh, we also then had uh, another uh, lady who came in who wanted to be not identified for safety reasons, um, who as a person who grew up Jewish uh, had her own interpretations of what this issue was as she was growing up, but then she came to find out the truth and she wanted to share some of her perspectives. Now today I have another esteemed guest. Um, his name is Fawad Akabash Abu Shark. Abu Shark. Sorry about that because we tried practicing before, <laughs> before we started. Okay. And uh, the reason why I invited him to the show today is because he's extremely active in trying to spread the issue and the Palestinian cause. He is part of the Palestinian ha House um, of New England. He's also part of the Boston Coalition for Palestine. And he's also part of the um, North, Shire, no, North Shore for Palestine. Um, and I wanted to invite him today to talk about locally the work he's been doing to spread this particular topic and, and awareness on this topic and uh, some of his um, own advice and ideas on moving forward um, on this particular issue. So thank you for uh, joining us today. I know you came from a pretty long distance to join <laughs> us in person. Um, I also know you are very active and you have done a lot of local shows and you've worked with different companies and organizations to really spread awareness. Do you mind giving us, like, first of all, um, the organizations that I met, mentioned, what their purpose is, how your involvement is, and what currently are they doing with the current situation? Okay, the three main organizations is the Palestinian House of New England, which is a group, it's more of a social group. Uh, we've been around for a long time. And our main goal is basically we talk about Palestine and the issue, and that's usually through sometimes uh, events, parties, things like that, where we invite people and try to explain, or, you know, social uh, gatherings and stuff like that. We also come up sometimes with flyers, educational things, etc., and we try to spread it. Uh, the Boston Coalition for Palestine, we started it back in October after the attacks on Gaza, and the same with the North Shore for Palestine. The Boston Coalition for, we both, you know, the, I, we, I was part of starting both of them, and we both pretty much, actually all three have the same goals eventually, which is raising awareness about the issue, uh, presenting the Palestinian side in the real picture, clarifying and educating people on what's really going on, because just like you mentioned, the media, especially the United States media, it's not just not mentioning much, they are very, very one-sided, which is shameful because even the Israeli and outside media started to bring the whole picture, but for some reason, uh, you know, CNN, ABC, NBC, no matter what it is, it's not like one or the other, they're just going back with the blackouts and only presenting one side for whatever the reasons are. So it is part of us. We do believe that uh, we need to work harder, we need to bring awareness, and we re need to raise individuals and groups to do something. And that's through the rallies and, you know, the events that we do. Through so I wanted to... Um kind of emphasize what you said was, which I also found interesting, mm -hmm. that if even in Israel, there's, um, you know, there's newspapers, there's articles for the other side, which we do not see in this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we sit here and we talk about freedom of speech and we always talk about that we don't have censorship. 
But we have other countries in the conflict itself who are allowing other articles and other points of views to be talked about and, and discussed, but we can't do it in this country. So leading with that, have you found um, some pushback on your push for awareness on this issue? With the media specifically, big time. Uh, even when they come to interview us or when they do one of our events, we get 20 seconds out of the two minutes segment or whatever, and they always emphasize on the other side. Uh, our press releases for the events, they never say anything about it. Media is very, very, really one-sided. And the weirdest part, and actually I find it interesting, that a couple of days ago they had this huge issue about CNN who actually they found out, they go through the Israeli filters before they post anything about the event. And it shocked me. I mean, Haritz doesn't. Uh, channel 13 and 12, the Hebrew channels, they don't. Badi'ot uh, Ahranot, most of even, like I said, the Israeli media doesn't do that. Yet CNN, and I don't know about the others, but I'm gonna assume it's gonna be the same, they are actually going through the Israeli filters. Where is the freedom of the press? Where is, where is presenting the picture? You know, they should be basically trying to show what's going on, the honest story, and trying at least to bring the both sides equally. But to go through an Israeli filter is really takes every credibility from CNN at least, but I'm going to extend that non-credibility to all American media at this point. I don't think any of them is really a dependable source of information, just pure fake propaganda and lies, and that's shameful. So which organizations are willing to hear what you have to say? In the media, almost none. And even when we did the events in New Year's Eve or with the lighting of the tree in Boston or all our, our marshes, which was amazing because the smallest marsh we had since October 11 this year, we gathered 12, 13,000 people to marsh. And this is miles and everything. This is unprecedented in the United States, which basically shows people are not happy with what's going on. But sadly, uh, starting all the way at the top with the president, his administration, Blinken and the media, his, they were like more Zionist than Netanyahu and the others. I mean, they're beyond extreme, you know? And to have all the support in what I am gonna call a genocide, and we have the biggest hand in it, it's just shameful. I don't understand why Biden and his administration will go like that, and I'm pretty sure that push on the media has to do with the administration up there. It's just, I don't know what are they getting out of this because he keeps talking about, you know, democracy in this country and protecting it. Then you go outside, you do something like this, you, you know, you participate in a genocide, you do a blackout in the country about the press. What democracy that he is trying to protect? and trying to scare people for 2024 to vote for him. Why am I voting for you? You're not giving me democracy. You're not giving me peace. You're sharing in a one-sided genocide, pure out killing. I mean, 30,000 people dead, and we have eight, 9,000 under the rubble that we don't know about. How much more is going to be enough before Biden and the administration say enough is enough? And with the media, they're just following. And I, I can't guarantee it. I mean, I don't have the evidence, but deep inside, we all feel they are being getting instructions and everything to kind of make it hush-hush or to go one-sided. They don't want any voice against them because at this point, they have no credibility, especially with all this come out by the people, the students, the... and. It, the best part for us, which became a really the biggest shameful part for this, most Jewish people are coming out saying, stop the genocide, stop the killing, stop, you know, cease fire now. And then few, not even 15, 20% of Jews in the United States who are pure Zionist, who is still supporting that. Most Jewish, actually, even around the world, because we saw it in London, we saw it in the United States, and everywhere, there are more and more Jewish people, God bless them, that saying, not in our name, is not enough is enough. Uh, it's it just, 
because it became more of a humanitarian issue at this point than anything else. No matter what your politics are, you cannot kill 25, 30,000 people. You cannot throw 2 million people on the street and nowhere. I mean, just think of the weather now here, and we run into the five minutes we walked to cross the street from our cars, we came running to the heat. Just imagine this 24-7 for 2 million people with mostly families and children. Uh, this is, and they say a catastrophe. I don't like to use that word because catastrophe is an earthquake or a storm or something like right. this. Man-made is not a catastrophe. Man-made issues are genocide and ethnic cleansing. And if you don't want to say it for the administration, that's their business. Facts are on the ground. The history is going to remember it, and I hope, as an American Palestinian, that in 50, 60 years from now, they don't look at the United States like we identify Nazi Germany yeah. in the past. This is, to me, a big concern. I've been in this country over four years. My family is here. My children are here. I don't want them to have to face what some of the German faced because of what happened in the forties and the Holocaust and all these things. And eventually history will punish whoever did what. And I might not be for it, but my kids, my grandkids, I want them to be in a better place. And this is why I'm hoping that the politics of this country really change, become more balanced. And most of all, no matter what the issue is, and I don't want to even hear who started it, because this is another wrong expression, you know, because it doesn't really matter. At this point, ceasefire, permanent, is no other way around it. There is no other way around it. We need to stop this. It has to be permanent. We cannot have those two days here and three days there, yeah. feeding people then and killing them. You can't do that. It has <laughs> to be permanent. And more important, we need to start being serious about finding a solution, a permanent solution, a long-term solution. We cannot keep emboldening Netanyahu and Ben Rafir and the extremists of the extreme where they are extending the war so they don't go to jail and we are giving them the pass out of jail. Shameful. So I'm, I'm very happy you're doing all this work in terms of <clears throat> protests and events. Uh, how, I mean, at some point, how many people are actually being aware of this? Because the people that are showing up um, already agree that this is a humanitarian issue, it needs to stop. When the media is not covering it, how do you, how do you think the word is actually getting out? Is it really getting out or are we just preaching to the crowd? Actually, it is going out. And this is what's killing Zionism at this point. For all many, many years in the past, there was only the fake media and the one-sided media. Since the internet and the social media and all these things, all of a sudden, everybody with a microphone or a, a camera or a phone or anything becomes media. And this is why the whole thing around the world is changing. They see firsthand every day, every minute, they can see on the ground what is going on. They see the murders, they see the destruction, they see the equators of the 2,000 bombs that being dropped on civilians, they see hospitals being invaded. Now the game is not the same, and this is why you see all this support all around the world, not just the United States. I mean, all around the world, in England, when you have half a million people, that's a small demonstration. You know, just the other day, this past last weekend, you know, in DC, 500, 600,000 people showed up. And the reason why I bring it up, because a month ago or something, the Zionists tried to do something in DC, in the same, you know, thing. And they were actually paying the people to go. Yes, yeah, I saw that. You know, they were paying the people and they couldn't get 100,000. We have people from all over the United States paying sometimes big money. If you're coming from Oregon or Texas, this is not a bus, 100 bucks from Boston. Yeah. People are paying big money because they want to be there. They want to show to the whole world enough is enough. 
let's stop it. Never again means now and everybody. And the biggest advantage we get now, and this is again where the Zionists are really getting freaking out about it, that people started to understand it's not the Jewish state. It's not Judaism. It has nothing to do with religion. Zionism is a racist political idea that started based on apartheid and on the genocide that's been going on for over 100 years. That's why as when people tell me, oh, Hamas started it. It started over 100 years. Hamas didn't exist. We know about massacres, about over 500 Palestinian villages that were raised in the 30s and the 40s. My parents, actually, Ashkelon, which is Asqalan al-Majdal, Ashkelon, as you call it here, that's where I come from. This is where most the kibbutz and the people in the settlement in Gaza moved, moved to. That's my hometown. This is where the, the attack or the resistance act actually happened. So <clears throat> it's just people now know, they understand more. And the biggest and more important thing, I cannot stress that enough. It's not about Judaism. It's not about Jewish people. Those are our brothers, sisters, families, neighbors, here and in Palestine. We lived in peace in Palestine since Salah al-Din and the Crusaders, and even before that, when Omar ibn al-Khattab got the keys to Jerusalem. Jewish, Christians, and Muslims lived together in peace. None of this happened until Zionism, which has actually, it was designated as a racist movement back in the 70s by the United Nations. And you know, the other thing that they keep talking about, Israel has the right to defend itself. I just want to ask the people to think about it. We here in South Africa speak for almost four hours, and then the Israelis spoke for almost three hours. They didn't mention self-defense. Do we know why? I do. Because the ICJ already told Israel, you don't have the right to self-defense against the Palestinians because you are an occupation. And the Geneva Convention, Article 5, 6, and 51 do not apply. And when they came specific about the case, Article 139 for 2004 told them straightforward, you have no right of any self-defense against the Palestinians. And when the Israelis, it's like, so what do we do? The, the answer, and this is the ICJ, you have to end the occupation, then you will have the right to self-defense. This is why South Africa brought the thing and they didn't bring it, and Israel never said it once, even though you see the president and the press and all these things, Israel has, and our senators and Congress people, which they all know this, but they just go ahead with the lie because they figure people don't do any research, people just believe whatever, and that is another part. But thank God for social media, even though we get our accounts get closed and we yes. get oppressed and you know we make this joke you know when you talk about guns you have this is a machine gun this is and you have a, a picture or oh, this is uh, you know the thing with the bullets in it then they put Zuckerberg picture and they write over it silencer because he is part you know part of that you know I mean it, it, they do it as a joke but it's a sad joke when you think about it because. Eventually, this is all going to come back and haunt us all. This, I mean, even with South Africa, they're already starting against the UK and the USA for assisting. Now, whether the ICJ decide this is actually a genocide by name or not, it doesn't really matter at this point because France came out yesterday with the thing is all this killing has to stop, but we cannot call it a genocide because we cannot tell the Jewish people who had a genocide on them that they're committing a genocide now. And to me, you're telling people, I'm not gonna vote for the genocide, even though it is a genocide. It's an admission that it is a genocide, but you don't wanna call it that because you feel bad for the Jewish people. Big mistake, because the Jewish people are calling a genocide and you are protecting Zionism and apartheid, you are not protecting the Jewish people. Huge increment in Islamophobia and in anti-Semitism 
And it is, this is a big part of it. Israel and Zionism is one of the biggest and worst part. And this is even according to Jewish, the rabbis. You know, we have rabbinos come to our, uh, you know, rallies and stuff. We have, most of them, not 50, 50 Jewish people, maybe they, many times they are more than us. Because this is not about religion. This is not about Jewish. This is not about Muslim. This is about Zionism and about a genocide and killing that needs to stop our senators, our Congress people. Or I'm not going to even mention Biden because he's, he, he said it himself, I'm the biggest Zionist and blah, blah, blah. He's going bragging about it. Well, you brag all you want, Genocide Joe. If that, because now that's his name, Genocide Joe. And he's going to keep it until he have a backbone and do something about killing. Killing has to stop. Support politics. Army against army doesn't matter. I mean, I don't support war. I do, I do not want anybody to die in any way, form, or shape. I want to make that clear. But if it's a war between two armies or something, but bombing a whole city of civilian, killing the tens of thousands, putting over almost two million people on the street in the middle of nowhere with nowhere to go, that's shame on anybody who participated. And sadly, the USA is part of the genocide here. And it, it, I hate that because I love this country. 42 years I've been in the United States and it's been a great country and a great host for me. So I would hate to see things like this happen. That, thank you for that because you addressed some of the questions I would have asked. I'm going to ask a very hard question. You may not be able to answer it. My, my biggest concern is I see on social media sometimes uh, soldiers, Israeli soldiers, committing horrific, horrific acts of, against humanity, mm -hmm. um, against children, against babies, against women, against elderly. And I, I really am trying to understand as a country, regardless Israel or not, it could be any country, but any country who allows that and encourages their soldiers to do that or allows the soldiers to get away with that behavior, I don't understand how that country can really invest in their citizens and the future of their citizens' mental health. And, you know, when, when soldiers commit those kind of atrocities, they may, for a short period of time, you know, feel like they did something good for their country, defended their country, however they wanted to justify it to themselves. But we know from the Vietnam War that things come back to haunt a human being. Absolutely. And so my concern is this this country who has allowed such atrocities, young soldiers to commit such as atrocities, I don't understand how their future is going to be. Do you, do you want to comment on any, like, because I really struggle with that. Okay, actually I do, in this sense, and I'm gonna make this very brief. Soldiers at wars are two kinds. There is a kind who does that because in the service and they do not understand and they obey. And there is a kind, sadly, with the IOF or IGF, as I call it now, which is Israeli occupying forces or Israeli genocide forces. That's the real name. There is no defense there. They train them for many, many years to take their humanity out. I mean, just think, a couple of weeks ago, we heard about a soldier who saw a baby in Gaza, and he took the baby and he sent it to occupied land to his family or something, then the guy died and his friend told about him and up until this day today, we don't know where the baby, Palestinian baby from Gaza, a lot, no information. I can go with these atrocities forever. We all heard about, and that's in the news and everywhere, about the 80 bodies that Israel brought and people couldn't recognize who they are because their organs and their skin and their everything was taken away and they just went into a mass grave. They train them in a way, they take, simply, they take their humanity out. I do not believe many countries do that, but because of Israel's way built and the way they built all everything they do based on hatred, on racism, on apartheid, even among Jewish themselves. You know, a fast story, when I went to Ashkelon last year to visit, I was there and I visited, we went Ashkelon, they built like so beautiful buildings you wouldn't believe it. And while we're driving, we saw an area like really run down. 
And I'm asking the driver with us. It's like, this doesn't look like even belong in town. And he goes, oh, those are the Ethiopians, Jews. And I said, and? He goes, if you give him a new building, they'll ruin it. And this is a, a driver, a tourist driver. This is shameful. This is hatred. This is racism. This is wrong at all levels. Sadly, Israel, and especially the government that we have now between Netanyahu, Ben Gavir, Smotrich, they picked the worst of the worst. And Biden is giving him, and Blinken, and uh, what's his name, the guy from the media, giving him a blank check with our tax money and a blank, a, all the support without any questions asked. We don't do this with our own people. Why would we give it to somebody else? If I am, as an American, have actually certain limits to where I go, then why Israel doesn't get the same limits I have? Even this thing now about trying to make uh, anything against, you say against Israel or against Zionism is anti-Semitic. They're not even, you know, I am Semitic. As a Palestinian, I am a Semitic. I am the one who, if you say anything against me, you become anti-Semitic. Most those Jewish people, you know, Smotrich and Netanyahu, they're not even Semitic because only Jewish from Middle Eastern descent are the Semitic ones. Ashkenazis aren't, European aren't, because, I mean, they, we don't have time to go through the Semitism yes. and explain all that, but we need to start distinguish. Why are we giving them this impunity, this no matter what you do, you're going to get away with it, just like what France just did and Germany, because they use the same excuse. It's shameful. This is not going to help, but it is changing, and I am actually really positive. Freedom has a price. We as Palestinians are paying part of the price now. Algiers lost over a million martyrs. Algiers is an independent country. Always, always, I have this feeling, right is going to win, and we are eventually going to win and have peace back. And our brother and sister Jews are going to be enjoying and celebrating with us against racist apartheid Israel and Zionism. Thank you. So we're out of time, and what, what a conversation. I think we can continue this for a while. Um, we touched on a lot of topics, and, and I would like to just leave a few words with you that just think about um, humanitarianism. And I think that's, that's the main word that we need to concentrate on when we talk about this issue. It's not a religious issue. It's not, um, it is a occupied type of situation, you know, um, a state that is illegally occupying territories. But in the end, it's still a humanitarian issue. It's not self-defense when it has gotten one-sided this bad to this scale. Over, like we said, 30,000 people dead, more than 10,000 children, and we don't know countless and thousands of thousands of bodies estimated around 10,000 under, under the rubble that they still have not accounted for. And I believe that at this point, as we have said, and as our guest said very, very eloquently, as a country, we don't want to be on the wrong side of history on this one. So thank you again for watching Perspectives with Asma Silva, and I hope you join again.